think. Yes. Yeah. Okay. First of all, <clears throat> how is my sound? I always have some issues with either way too loud or way too um, low. Today it's perfect. Yeah. Ah, great. So yes. So my name is Stig, and as Jan said, I'm also working here high, high up north in Tromsø. So I will now first try to share my screen. So I will do the presentation and then Jan will take the role as a co-presenter here. So do you see my um, the HackMD page now, hopefully? Yes, we see it. Great. So let's first have a look at, okay, try to navigate to where we are and where we want to, to go. So I see now we have a few uh, suggestions or uh, softwares that we people want to use. I have to say quite a few of these are unfamiliar to me. So maybe we have some new exotic users here. So, but, <clears throat> So what we want to do today, if we go first, go to the, so start here at the HackMD and go to the um, schedule page. So as Tanya said, we are, have three sessions or maybe four sessions today. We'll start now with uh, accessing software. So we click into this and then we have the course page here. So the plan for this session is roughly 45 minutes where I will, present something for and demonstrate for 30 minutes and then we'll end with an exercise. So what, what should I open? Should I type along? Should I have the course page open? Yes, this would probably be a good occasion to type along if you would want to do that. So, but my screen space is a bit limited. Is it better to have the course page open or, you, or like look at your screen? Uh, okay, so is I guess the it should be in portrait mode, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, it is. Ho hopefully you will be able to have both my screen and your own terminal. So okay. or yeah, so I will um, yeah, so I will show it only a terminal uh, in a while, just in a while. So so I can <clears throat> I can use this course page later as reference reference. And I don't yes. have to follow, I read along now. No. So I will go, well, yeah, I will go through most of what is uh, what is here, but not, so it, it, there, it's a lot of text. So if you scroll through this page, there's a lot of text and I won't read it uh, as it is, but I will try to follow uh, the main concepts there. Yeah. And so okay, so, so you, you, can, you can later always go back and read the page. Yes. So you, think you only need the page later when we do the exercises, but until then, just like focus on what we show. Yep. So what are the objectives that we want to achieve here? So first of all, so up to this point, we have seen, um, well, I have to say still very useful things. We have learned useful tricks for how to get around and how to do uh, practical things on the cluster. but. Of course, all of us or all of you are here because you have some kind of scientific problem that you want to solve. And then we need the really the, the high-end scientific software that we also have installed on the HPC cluster, but you haven't really seen any of them yet. So here we will find out how can we uh, find out what kind of software is actually available and how can we make use of it? Because it's uh, quite important that uh, when you log into the system, so onto the, the login node, uh, none of these scientific software are actually immediately available to you. So we need to, to take some action to, um, to be able to use them. Uh, can you show this? Like, let's say I, I want to, I, I use a lot of Python in my like, daily life work. Yes. So, for that, I will just move this out of the way. So now you can see, hopefully, a terminal. Make this a bit smaller. So hopefully, this is readable. Um, so I have a terminal on top. And then 
on the bottom here, I will show that it will be displayed all the commands that I show. So you have seen this setup before in this uh, workshop, I guess. So now I'm on my local machine. So I will, as always, start by SSHing into the into Saga in this case. So SSH, my username, saga dot sigma two dot now. Right. So and I have a passwordless login, so I get straight in. You may have to type your password at this point. Okay, so now we are in. Um, okay, one note, perhaps, if you are following this from from, I understand that there may be some problems with the file system on from. So you might have some slow response if you try to do this on from. So I would suggest if you want to type long, you should do it on Saga. Um, okay, so let's start from the top. So now when I type something, LS, it should show up down here. Yes, as a, as a history. Okay, so this is basically my uh, home directory, not very tidy. Um, so, yes. So as I said, when you log into the cluster, you won't have any real scientific software available, but we have seen some kind of um, software. We have already used some like Nano, the um, text editor. And also, as you said, your uh, Python. So um, there were some users that wanted to use Python. I saw from the, the, the question this morning. Um, so when you log in, there actually is some Python version available. So um, so if you just type Python, yes. So I don't have to follow the rest of the lesson anymore because we have a Python like I'm also now fine. I don't need anything else. Yes. Yes. So we'll see. So if you try to do this and we want to check the version, you can see that we have a just the old Python 2.7 available when you log in. But this is typically not what you want. So that's the point. So there are quite a few system packages installed globally on the system when you log in. And, but these are typically the things that are required for the system to work properly. So this is not usually what you want to use for your scientific work. So that means that we need some other way of... Um, uh, is there also Python 3 we can use? The, yes, let's see. There should, if you type explicitly Python 3, there should be something, which is also quite old, 3.6. Yeah, okay, that's a bit old. That's true. Yeah. So, so, how do I get now like a newer version? Do I have to install it myself or how does it work? Yes, so that is actually um, one option that we will not discuss in this course. But as Tanya said, we have this follow up course in a few weeks where we actually will discuss a bit more how you can install stuff yourself. And this depends a bit on the type of cluster that you're working on. But for our, so the Envis clusters, uh, we typically have quite a, a large number of pre-installed packages, so software packages that you can load and use. But on other uh, systems, if you happen to come across something, uh, something else, then you might have to install much more on your own. But we will not show this. Um, today. Today we will only use things that are already installed on the machine. Um, so uh, let me just check here. So how, how is this software installed? This. Yeah, so this one, right. So what happens when we type Python like this, you might ask. Um, so where does, how does the shell know that Python is a command that you can use. And for this, we have something, a uh, shell command called which, that will actually show you what Python means in this context. So when you type Python, it will actually run this command instead, um, which is user bin Python. So this is a path to an executable no, uh, named Python, which is located under user bin on the machine. 
So how is that helpful? Um, Well, the point is that these system packages that are already installed are usually installed in locations like this under user bin. Um, and then, so how, how does the, uh, the shell find this? Well, then to check this, we, we can inspect. Uh, so this is a bit technical, but I think it's important for, uh, for people to understand exactly how the the modules work that we will look into in a minute. Um, but if we inspect uh, an, an environment variable called path, so I don't know if we have discussed environment variables before in this course. Can you remember? Not so much. Yeah. But basically, there are, <clears throat> okay, first I can check this. So print n. So, uh, you don't have to uh, understand what all this means, but basically these lists quite a few environment variables that are available in the shell. So they, they have a variable name and a value. And among these, you should find one which is called path. And this is the only one that we will look at now. So um, this is the important one for uh, understanding how the these different softwares are picked up by the system. So this path variable should be located somewhere here in the list above. So what this command does is it takes the, the path var the, the variable named path and the dollar will extract the value from it and echo will print it. So when I execute that, it will print this string. So it's a colon separated list of paths, basically. So oh, you know, the, the, the shell will, or like the bash will try to find your command in one of those folders. Exactly. So and there's like a, a now of like, I don't know, six or seven or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So the point here is that when I type Python and execute, then the shell will um, look into all of these um, directories or locations on, the, on your machine until it finds a command that matches Python. And this was exactly what happened. So if, if you go back to this, uh, which says that under user bin, there was something called Python. This means that it looked there and there, and then finally under user bin, it found something called Python. And then it uh, executed the Python command for this. So, and one important uh, property here that I might ask uh, Jörn, uh, so what do you think would happen if there are more Pythons available somewhere else here? Um, so what if there is also a Python back here in cluster bin? What would happen? Then? I don't know. Either it picks one of them, like, or it asks you, or it just takes the first one, I think. Yeah, so there could be uh, several different uh, behaviors here. It could be the first one. It could actually be the last one that it um, mm. overwrites every time you find something new, or it might ask you what you want, or it might give you an error. But what is actually happening is that it picks up the first one, and then it exits, and it doesn't even look in the in the rest. And this is important, as we'll see later. Um, okay, so this is more or less what I wanted to say here about the the globally installed, the system packages that are available to you when you log in. And you should know that these are limited. There are not that many useful uh, things for what you want to do in your scientific work, I guess. So then I can perhaps also ask a question to uh, Jörn. Do you, uh, can you think of any reason why we don't install these uh, fancy uh, scientific softwares? So if you go back here and um, look at the, see if we have, right. So like MATLAB, for instance, why is this not installed immediately when you log into the machine? Why do we need to, to keep it clean in that way? Oh, uh, because I mean, this we have a lot of different users. So there might be a, like a ton of different software which is needed by different users at the same time. So it might be confusing if there's like all of that. 
especially sometimes programs could have the same name and then they would like, how do you distribute it? And also what I've done in my master's, it do you work a lot with like software packages with a certain version because you know it works for you. So if you if you if you install all of them, how like which version do you pick? Is it like say a certain Python version? Is it 3.9 or is it 3.8 or 3.10? And who decides how to change these versions? So that would be a bit confusing if everything would be installed globally. Yes, exactly. So the, this is really the main difference between what you do on your local laptop, because there you always know what you want, typically, and you uh, you just keep the versions that you need. And then when something new comes up, comes out, you upgrade and you install the new shiny version instead. But on a on a system like this, or a common cluster like this, where we have thousands of users, then we really need to keep all this tidy so that they don't conflict with each other, interact with each other in ways that we don't want. And also it's, it's really important for reproducibility in the end that we keep many different versions of the same package because uh, if you need to reproduce your results five years down, down the line, uh, it's important that we still have the old version of MATLAB available to you so that you get exactly reproducible um, results. Okay, so but how do we now how do we now find what is installed if this is how does it work? Yes. If they're not globally installed. Yeah, so as I said, on our systems we typically had quite a large software stack uh, compared to many other uh, HPC providers, I would say. Uh, but how do we find them? That is the, the next, and this is where the modules come in. So um, right, so if I scroll down now on the course page, down to the environment modules. So what is a module? Um, a module is, as it says there, a self-contained description of a software package. So it's like a package manager, like an app store, but uh, the difference between them is that it will not actually install the software. It is already installed. It just brings it into view, so to say for you when you load a module with MATLAB, for instance, or Python. So that is basically what a module is. And we will see uh, shortly how it, um, how it actually works as well under the hood, because it's not all that complicated when you, um, when you So how do you now find which software is installed? Yes. So now we go back to the terminal on Saga. So the important, uh, keyword here is module. So we have many different commands starting with module. And we can start with one module list. It's just a very useful one. It will list all the modules that you currently have in your environment. So the things that you now have listed. And so here we should one module is now. Yes. Yeah. What you, do you have loaded? You should see only one, which is this STD env. It's not important what it does. It's it's an important package for things to work. So you should not remove it. And this is what this S sticky means. But do you have to do anything or is it, why do you have that already? Yeah, so this is loaded automatically when you log into the system. Okay. So yeah. They you don't have to touch it. No. Okay, so then how can we find out what else is available to us? And there are a few, uh, two options here. And one which I recently learned actually by preparing for this course, which is the module uh, keyword. So I actually yeah, so, use this. So I, I want to do some bioinformatics stuff. That's yes. So then you can, then you can. How do I find now software which is installed? Yeah. So then you can search. So this will do a keyword search based on the some metadata in the in the modules or the, the software that we have installed. So if you just uh, execute this module keyword bio, it will produce a long output in this case. Not, I won't go into details here, but basically what you see here are um, so different programs listed that we have installed. So these are available to you. So here you have the name of uh, software and then we have some different versions installed here. So we'll get back to the meaning of 
some of these uh, cryptic names, the long cryptic names here uh, later. So this is one way to find uh, what you want. So, but it will display me all the software that is of the top, like contains bio somewhere. Yeah, somewhere in the some metadata, some description of the package. Okay. Um, yeah. But then we have another one, which is module avail, which is one I usually use, which is more specific. It will only search for the, the name of the module. Um, so let's say Python. So if we then say search for um, Python, so it will take a search string, um, which in this case is Python. Then it will print all these modules, explicitly the modules that are installed that we can load that contain Python in the name somewhere. So this is also a quite extensive list, but you can see it picks up a few weird things. So if you wanted just a new Python version, this is uh, a bit- Yeah, uh, there's so many, like uh, there's Python contained somewhere, but it's not necessarily what I want. I would just was Python plain, yes. not Matplotlib yeah. or something. Right, so here you can see that these are the Python versions, so the plain Python that you would, would like to install. Okay, yeah. so I just have to scroll through to find what I need. Yeah, and then, well, you can actually be a bit more specific in the search. So this uh, slash is, is not a special meaning, it's in explicitly uh, in included in the search string. So now we can search for things that have Python and a slash. That will make it a bit more uh, restricted. Okay, so now we have these. Okay, so now maybe some explanation on the name here. Um, so can you... Um, so let's so say in the last line, there's Python and it's 3.96, which I guess is the Python version because it looks like a Python version, a rather current one. Yes. And then, so the slash, the first is a name of the module or like the program. And then you have the, the slash and then you have the version. And then you have something, I mean, GCC core or something. I don't know what this is. Yeah. But, and there's Intel as well, I see. But, yeah. uh, but this is just- CUDA and- Yeah, yeah but this is this crap. Yeah, so yeah, so you're right. So the first thing before the slash is the name of the, the program. And then the immediate numbers after this is the refers to the, version of that software package. And then everything that comes after this, it might be a long thing like this here. We also have some Python, but these really um, shows the dependencies that this package has. And it's, uh, it's not so important what it means. So, but what you should keep in mind is that you should try not to mix things. So if you load something that has a GCC core 11.2, you should not, mix and load something else that has a GCC core 8.2, for instance, because that might lead to some weird errors if you, or you're actually not allowed to do that immediately. If you try to do it, you will get an error when you try to load it. Um, uh, I see there's also like a bit up there's for example, FOSS 2021B and Intel 2021B. There's, can I mix those because of the same number? Um, yeah, that can probably, uh, yeah, I think you, you can probably mix, but you might manually have to do some swapping. So these um, FOSS and Intel are, so they are what's called tool chains. So they will, there are some meta modules that will contain other useful packages that like for um, uh, linear algebra or stuff and, uh, and parallelization, so MPI. And they are but, might might be compatible, but uh, yeah. So I should try to like stay in the same tool chain. Yeah. On the same like GCC core and then whatever number it is. Yeah. So this is okay. rather important. So, but now let's say I want to have the three point nine six, so the most current Python version. How do I know? I know that the module exists. How do I load it? Or yes. How can I use it? So then we have the. Um, command module load, which is quite self-explanatory, right? So now we want to load this module, Python 396, because if you remember, we had this 36 something that was installed on the system, but now we want something more recent, uh, 396. And then if I just execute this module load, it should not produce any output or anything. Um, so then the question is, did anything 
happened? What happened when I did this? Um, can we check by Python version? Yes. If it worked. So if we try to do this, now you can see uh, it actually returns this uh, later, the, the thing that we just um, loaded. And even for the Python command, if you remember before, we had the Python and Python 3, where the plain Python command actually referred to Python 2.7 something. So if I if I now want some software, I can either like look it up with module keyword and then like uh, like so I want to have an overview, or if I know what software specifically, I can use module avail and then whatever blast or OTI or whatever like bioinformatics software for example, and then I pick a package and then I load it with module load in the package name. Yes. Okay. Now it doesn't sound too too complicated. Yeah. A bit more effort, but. So if we then, uh, so let's see, first of all, how much time we have left here. So we are supposed to end at? I think we have 10 more minutes for our lecture and then 15 for the, okay. or like yeah. eight more minutes for us. Yeah. So then, so back to this uh, technical stuff. So the path thing that I've already um, discussed. So what, just to explain a bit what these, what module load actually does, because it's not, all that complicated. When I first started HPC many years ago, I thought this was some, some like like your package manager that it it in some way installed something or mounted some file system that and removed everything else that uh, was already there. But uh, now I know that it's it's really a small lightweight thing, and so we can now. Oops. There. If we again look at this, um, which Python? So to see what the Python command now refers to. After I loaded the module, you can see that it changed. So it used to be user bin Python. Now it is this long thing under cluster software and then the name of the package. Um, so how did the system know that it should now look for Python here and use this one instead? And then if we Again, look at this, um, the path variable that we saw before. So you can see it has now become much longer. And if you look closely, you can see that uh, so maybe here, this should be exactly the same as it was before when you log in. So you would have your username here. Um, but then what actually happened when we did the module load is that it prepended this string with a lot of other stuff. So this is why the, the order of the search is important that we discussed. So you can see here in the very first path, you have the trust to work software Python. And this is actually where it found the Python program in this case. So it, it's, it looked up in this first path and it found it and it exits. So. Okay, so now we, and so how would they now like do it in like daily life if I want to use, do I have to load the module um, before I start the job? So do I load the module and then send off this, the, the job script? Because usually I don't do this stuff, um, like in, uh, do my work in job scripts and not directly on the command line. So. Right, so there are a few different ways. So then the best way to, to do this is to, to, to be explicit on. So what you can do, of course, is that you load everything that you, that you want on your login, and then you just work from there. And everything, when you submit scripts or thing, it will, might pick up the, the correct environment when you do this. This is not recommended. So you should be very explicit that you always start from a clean slate where you have no or only the STDMV loaded and then load explicitly everything that you need for a job. So this would be in a job script. Um, so for example, there, oops, there is an example uh, in the end, uh, in the lecture. So I won't discuss this in more detail, I guess. But yeah, so here, so in a job script, you should, I actually did not, um, I didn't show the, the purge yet. Okay, maybe first. Make another <clears throat> example, which is 
Okay, let's backtrack a bit. <laughs> so first of all, now we have this uh, uh, module, we loaded the module Python, and we remember that we had the std-env already loaded when we, um, when we logged in. So then how many packages would you expect that there are now if I type module list? No, I guess like two. So the, I mean, yeah, you would guess it should be only these two. But if you do this, you can see that there are quite a few other packages, right? So you see, we still have the std end, and we have this um, the thing that we actually loaded. But we got quite a few others. You can see here, <clears throat> and the reason for this is that the uh, so the module system will automatically take care of all the dependencies. So all of these other packages are in some way necessary for the Python package to work. And the module system knows this. So then it, it picks up uh, all of these um, and loads them automatic, automatically for you. So you, you don't have to uh, take care of that. Okay, so then do the module purge command. So how can you get a clean slate again? Once you have loaded some weird packages and you want to get back to a, to a clean state, then you have the module purge. And I will highly recommend to use the purge instead of the unload, which we also have. So we have an, a module unload uh, command, but that will only, well, you can actually do that first. If I do module unload on the Python, just copy that thing. So it will unload the Python uh, package, but if we do a module list again, you can see that it kept all the dependencies. And this is typically not what you want. So to unload a package uh, is in this sense not uh, safe, I would say, because then you get a lot of stuff hanging around that you might not uh, be aware of that you have them. So what you should do instead is module purge, because this will remove everything except as it says here, the std env, which is the important sticky module that should always be there. So if I now do module list again, we are back to the login state. Okay, so then back to this um, JavaScript example. So a very good idea, uh, example for, or a good practice for when you write job scripts is to start this with module purge so that you get a clean slate and then load everything that you need um, for your job. So this is an example you can try out by yourself later. So it will again, just print this version, but you should then see this version 396 and not the 366, I guess, which was the default one. Okay, so in the future, I, if I write a JavaScript, I just write, um, I first figure out which like module I want, so which software and which version, and then I can uh, write on the top of my JavaScript uh, module and load, and then the software. What do I do if I have multiple software? Can I load multiple at the same time? Multiple models, more modules? Yes, but then it depends a bit, so that, brings back to this um, this uh, tool chain or the the last part here of the of the name so you can mix as many modules as you like as long as they are compatible in this sense so they they need to have the same gcc core uh, module be based on the same gcc core module otherwise you can run into some weird runtime errors so okay. but if, if that happens that you are not able to find two packages that you really need, and uh, you're not able to, to find something that matches, uh, you can just write um, a support request and maybe we can install the things that, that you need. Um, or maybe you can, you can separate your, your job script, right? Um, so in this case, if you have, first you need to do something with this Python version, and then later you need uh, below you need to do some with a different Python version for some reason, then you can first load only this one and then after do the thing that you need, then you can purge and load a different one, which is not compatible with the first one. It might be, yeah. yeah. So, 
So I can just like write module load multiple and uh, like multiple lines of module load with different softwares, and yes. it will load all of them in that order. Yes. Okay. Unless you get this uh, um, tool chain incompatibility, then you will get an error message if you try to load two that are not compatible. So it's. Uh, so, but you can try this out on the like interactively on the login nodes, and you can. And there's no harm because you can always go back with more module purge. Yes. To the clean. Yeah. So module purge is uh, very important, and it, it it's your friend. You should always do this uh, a lot to start start fresh, and not not try to to load new things on top of each other if you don't really don't need it because that can can lead to some some weird problems. And, and I can always look what the modules are um, this module list. Yes. Okay. And I guess it makes sense to put that in the top of your um, job script so that you, in the output you always see which modules you actually had loaded. Because I mean, some of them I saw like were like loaded. I mean, we loaded Python, but there were like 12 more packages. So I guess it makes sense to have a module list sometimes in your job script to see what actually happens and if everything's all right. Yeah, that's a good, good point. So it, actually, there should be so. A, 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 sec, a third line here with module list, which states explicitly what is loaded uh, when this uh, job runs. And this is yes. will help a lot when you when you want to ask for help, for instance, when something crashes. And um, yeah, uh, because otherwise the support staff has to guess a bit what you actually loaded and what is happening. And if it's yes. like clearly stated in the output file, then yeah. it makes its jobs for us a lot simpler, and we can help you faster. Yes. Okay. okay. Well, I think I've... we have 12 minutes or something for the exercises. Yeah. So I think it's time to just move into the exercise. Um, so you can see here. So this is what you would try to do now in a breakout room, breakout room I guess. So here you should, if you have been um, typing along, I would suggest that you start out this by module purge so that you get a, a clean slate. And you should verify that std env is the only thing that you have in your module list when you start this. So then I guess we can. Yeah, thanks. OK, so let's start then. Uh, now we are, uh, if you are lost, you can come back to the, um, the HackMD and then go to the course page. And on the course page, we have uh, done with the day one. Uh, day zero, day one, and day um, day zero and day one, and we are on the day two on the transferring files. This section. So we are going here. Mm. And then, yeah, why do why do you need uh, do you transfer files a lot, or why do you need what what, what do you why do you need files uh, on HP system, and why okay. do you transfer? Sabri, I have a few scenarios. Now I yes. learn how to submit a job. Uh -huh. and uh, write your job script and how to submit it. Uh -huh. And now uh, Tig and Jörn uh, taught us how to access different modules, whatever uh, softwares I want to run my program. Mm -hmm. But I have my input files and my Fortran code or Python code in my laptop and some of the input files uh, in the internet. Mm -hmm. So I need to have all this at, on HPC. So that's why I want to learn uh, how to transfer the files. And I want to run the program. And after that, I will have some output. And post, after post-processing, I would like to have this output in my lap, uh, laptop mm. so that I can give some presentation, nice presentation, what I have done with uh, my program. OK. So you want the inputs and the output files, but uh, they are not already there in the cluster or the no. system, you need to get this. Yeah. So shall we try first how to get something from the internet? Of course, yeah. I yes. have a lot of in, uh, input files yes. there, so that's good. I yes. think we have mentioned it in the Linux course, but it would be nice to have a recap of how to download that. Yes, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a folder for myself. Um, downloads, for example. Uh, so that folder is already there, it says. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to go inside that. CD, change directed downloads. Let's see what's already there. Okay, there's nothing, but you know, it's empty folder. So I want, this is, I want uh, Saga, by the way. 
So Saga uh, login one machine and on inside the download folder. So I want something that's already there in the course material. Uh, in the if you go to the course material, the main page, you will find a link called downloads. Um, so if you have trouble finding where this download link is, you should um, mention that in the HackMD and our colleagues will help. Uh, so it's not in inside the transferring files uh, um, lecture, but it's a separate heading itself, downloads. The reason that it's uh, done this way is for you to show how to get a link as well. So here there's a file which uh, with the hot link, that means you can download. If you click it, it will download onto your laptop. But what you want to do, uh, Dania, is sort of get this directly into Saga without downloading it to our laptop and then transferring it. It's, yeah. uh, it, we don't need that. So we're going to uh, hover over this and do a right click. And there are a lot of things that you can do. Under this, I'm going to click on this copy link uh, URL. So I'll copy link um, shortcut. So it'll copy the link to my clipboard. Um, did you get that? Yeah, I got yes. it. Yes. So then what we do is we go to the, where the, um, um, the, the, uh, on Saga, the directory that we, uh, made and use the command W get W get and do the right click and paste or uh, right mouse button or whatever the shortcut pasting button you use, but you, uh, the control C, control V did not work yesterday, as you remember. So I just use the mouse. Uh, so using the terminal does not mean that you have to get rid of the, like the mouse clicking down here. So it, it, it's, we are not sort of, uh, it, it has to be our convenience and uh, the way we work, uh, mm -hmm. it has to be simple. Um, so then we click that, then it will download the file and it will paste it here on the same place. So I could do so different things like, you know, I could give a different name for the file, you know, so many things I can do with this, but by default, only thing you need is a wget and the link. Is that okay? Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. But I just wondering, can we try a, a man page of wget and see the resolution? Yeah. Yes. Is that something you do or? Um, yeah, if I, if I want to get uh, options that I don't remember, which I definitely don't, I can go there and have a chup, uh, have a look. Um, and you know, it says what, are, what, what, what options that I can use, um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. what, what happens if I do a, da, a D, uh, what if I do a R, uh, and then, you know, how to, uh, do this in the background, um, how to specify output file. If you don't want the default file name, if you, you can rename it to a different file. This is sometimes very useful when you're downloading certain links uh, where it will create a file name, which would not make sense to you. Like let's say test or log or whatever. So if you want to give another name. So and you we, can can, also... we can use all these uh, flags according to our convenience, right? Yes, according to our need, uh, our convenience, we can use. We can also use a verbose mode to print uh, much details about it. And to get out of this, I'm going to press the key Q, Q on the keyboard, and I'm out of it. So that is to the easier way. If you want to get a faster file from the NCBI or download the thousand genome or whatever it is, you don't have to come to your laptop. So you might not even have space in your laptop or your desktop to first download it. So you can directly get it using this method. Um, and then I'm going back to the material now, the transferring files. Um, so when we were um, discussing this, um, uh, the topic, so we, we sort of, uh, you sort of suggested that you have heard of this uh, scenario here. Yeah. Uh, can you explain me a little bit about what this is about? Uh, this is something when I uh, send some envelope, which I have a copy, uh, um, uh, one copy I have to send uh, to one of my un other address or something I want to have in other home moving. And I ask uh, Poston or Bring or some other companies and in the, on the envelope, I need to write the address. So my mm -hmm. name and the address or the recipient's name and address. 
So that's what I was thinking when I was trying, when I wanted to transfer something from somewhere, I thought of having a name and address uh, to a, a name and to address mm. to where I should transfer. That's what I was thinking when I was mm. suggesting something, having an illustration of this. So, and it's, uh, it's more like a moving illustration here. But the, the example we will have, it's not maybe moving, it's copying what we have in the laptop. Mm -hmm. So, but the address part, this is what, uh, in, if I want to say it in a real world problem, an everyday mm -hmm. problem. So this is, I need, if I want to transfer something, I need to have the address. So uh, that is a good point. Like when you're sending something, one thing uh, with this diagram, uh, this diagram is for like illustration. You should not take it literally. Uh, so one thing Danya mentioned is that when we are sending file, this sort of implies that we are sending what we have and we will lose from our end. But actually we will we are sending a copy, not moving. Uh, but then the address. So it, it's very important to uh, inform the courier that where he, where he or she should take it, you know, the endpoint. So here it says my username, uh, as we did uh, with the, when you're logging into Saga, for example, he used my username at, and our cluster and my folder. So there's a reason for this using these pronouns here as well. So it's, it's my username, but it's our cluster, which means it is not me that, uh, that we are going to some common place where we have a niche, where we have some our, our own space, but it will be first go to a common place first. Uh, then we give it to the courier and here it says uh, it's your laptop. And then the internet is the, your transport highway, like uh, you know the, the, the package will travel. Um, so then uh, through the internet, it will go, it will end up in our cluster, but in our cluster we'll have racks. I have my rack, I have other users racks. So the, the post person, the courier should uh, know we have to place it. So we have to not only tell that uh, about my identity and the cluster address, it's also important to tell where, in which rack it should be placed. Uh, one more thing we see here uh, as like additional bonus uh, example is that uh, Thomas and Radon will talk about later when they talk about quota is, if your rack is full, then the postman would not be able to place it. What do you think uh, if that happens, Danya? So you send a package, address is correct, the cluster is correct, and when you go to your rack, your rack is full. What would happen? Then it will not place it there. Yes. So that also brings up the uh, importance of after you're copying it, it's it's uh, it's important to make sure what you send and what you received are uh, identical. <clears throat> Have you any fa faced any issues uh, when transferring files that you know the whole of the file was not transferred? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, I was I had a user case in the past uh, yeah. when uh, there was one of this uh, chemistry solver. As I I don't remember exactly which one was, but I uh, remember that issue exactly. So yeah. when it was transferred, it was not fully transferred, but uh, there was this file name because it was partially transferred there. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll just uh, do a quick uh, demo on uh, to check that as well, although this is not in the material, we'll just uh, do a quick, um, not not a quick, I mean like a, uh, look at it. Yeah. Um, so uh, now what we are going to do, uh, Dania, is send a file from my laptop um, to Saga and get something back from Saga. Hmm. Um, one important thing that I want to mention. Shabri. I lost you. Uh, can you hear me? Um, I think my, my Zoom decided to mute me for some reason. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. Yes, uh, which part did you hear last? Uh, no, just you came here, you were going yes. to transfer the okay. so. Uh, so I have uh, two terminals here. Uh, I'm going to open it with different colors for the sake of uh, showing the difference. Um, so this is um, Saga. This is my um, host name. 
right? It's my laptop. So I want some uh, file from my laptop to the saga and uh, uh, back and forth. Um, so the important thing um, to remember sort of is that when I'm sending files and I'm getting files back from Saga, I always do it from my laptop. Uh, and I'll tell you the reason. Um, I mean, like not from Saga, but from laptop. Um, so I'll tell you the reason uh, in a moment. So I'm going to create a file. So if you, you, you remember the command echo, uh, uh, I'm going to generate uh, some data, which is the current date, current state, current, uh, um, like what is the current time? So uh, this is to show you that, you know, there's no voodoo involved, you know, I'm going to create a file and that file exactly should be there in the, uh, in Saga. So we have this star file here uh, and I'm going to use the echo file to create a file called file uh, from laptop to ex ex explicitly say that, you know, to find out that's a file. So the, my file would look like this. So I'm going to send this file to Saga. Uh, so do you remember the, that Postman uh, example, Dania? Yeah. So, we, so the, in, the, in the example, if you remember that we slightly sort of showed the word SCP. So yeah. the program we are going to use is called SCP. Secure copy this file. So that is this file. And what else do you need? My I, need I need the name, uh, your username uh, mm -hmm. on Saga and mm -hmm. the host name. That's the address. And where do you want uh, in, in your home or in yes. the place uh, you want to put this file? So where do you want yes. it actually? So, um, so if I do like this or like more of like universal, like with a colon, it will end up in my home directory. So that is how what the example shows in our um, teaching material to make it simple because you might not have a folder called download. But uh, let me, um, before doing that, I, I'm going to comment it out and stop that command and I'm going to make my uh, terminal, the prompt little bit uh, narrower. Mm. So I'll have more space. Um, so we have the laptop uh, folder and we are, I'm going to send this to uh, my folder in, in my home directory. So this, uh, we could see what will happen. Yeah. Um, downloads, down, did I spell it correctly? The, the spellings and- Yeah. We yes, we'll try it with this colon. Uh, this might uh, cause an error, I don't know, but let's see. Then it asks for the password. I guess uh, you know my password by now, it's not visible. Okay, and it's wrong. Oh. Let me type my password and come back again. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to, I think I have my caps lock on. I'm just uh, checking my password in another terminal, no magic. Uh, until uh, until I uh, sort of figure out my why my keyboard has changed, uh, can you talk about a little bit about um, the what would have happened? How how would you sort of check um, the file was there? Uh, 
yeah i would uh um, yeah there was there is a comment on my zoom i uh, check your username so someone of your power not for participants are asking you to check your username if you are doing that right yes um so thank you for that yeah uh, in, in fact in fact that was um, that was the problem uh yes so now i set it up in a um another way yeah uh, so i'll do that again uh, so i have my uh, uh, file that from laptop uh, let's do that again this file so i want to send this uh, to saga so mm -hmm. i'm going to use the cp command and my username uh, saga dot sigma two dot no and uh, then what did i do i did i say download yeah mm -hmm. downloads right let's, let's try that one um so now it will uh, go there so it will it will travel through the internet and it will land on the cluster let's see here and you see this from my laptop and let's see whether these files are identical um so you have the content here right this content and this content is the same as you can see there um but a more robust way to check the file is um hash uh, check the the checksum which uh, which is not in the teaching material but we could have a um chat about it on the uh, the hack md so you have this program to get this uh, identifier for the file you, you use this command sha j256 some for example um and then from laptop so if you see that this is identical so you could check the first few characters example. so this is this uh, like a more robust way to check that what you send and what you received are the same thing and uh, the colleagues please place that paste place that command in the hack md uh, because that's not in the teaching material okay one question sabri when i have thousands of files is it going to uh, uh, give uh, take a lot of time to do the checksum it uh, if i have a big size files um so the big size files um it will take uh yeah it, it, it depends on like if, if a terabyte level file it might take some time so that is acceptable uh, that is like expected uh but there's another thing that you ask about number of files so yeah. transferring files it's better to keep it um as an archive when you translate it so it is easier to check so in the read in the, in the material let's see whether we have um, time to go through that at the end of the material it says uh, it, it mentions a way uh, to keep very much, very many number of files, you know, a lot of files, how to keep, how to send them as a single file and then uh, expand it to the original format. So th there's no compression involved. That's the, 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 the size of the collection of the files and the archive created would be the same, but it's easier to check in that sense uh, whether uh, using a section, for example, rather than checking one individual uh, file by uh, one by one. Mm. Um, so that we'll, we'll see whether we can uh, go up to that one. Um, so this is the, from the um, uh, laptop to the saga. So I issue the command from my uh, laptop, if you remember this command. So then I'm going to create a file, the same thing that I did um on saga yeah before that may i ask you one question sabi mm -hmm. uh, what is the best practices to give the exact path when we transfer the files or uh yes so the giving the exact uh, path is better but uh, rather than the colon mentioned here the colon is uh, the i mean the as, as mentioned in the in the teaching material for example the tutorial we will um sort of give more examples there Okay. Uh, that is to minimize the minimize the knowledge you need to transfer a file we have just said 
mm, just send it to the home folder and then find it. But when you work on the cluster, your files get, uh, your um, uh, home directory might get, you know, clocked and you might have a lot of files that um, it's better to send it to one folder. So it is, it is easier to find what you send. Yeah, and I will also have more uh, project directories where I can use mm. uh, to load all this, uh, download all these files uh, because uh, my home may not have that much face uh, space uh, if I want uh, to download a lot of files. So in that case also this path uh, using the complete path is also. Um, that's very true. Um, so you, uh, I think uh, Thomas and uh, Radon would talk about quotas a little later. So there might be a time that there's not enough space in your home directory to transfer things in that case you will have your project directory cluster uh, projects sorry projects and one of these for example for the course you know i don't know whether they have a course folder yes. oh, there is one so you could send it here where you have more space so how do i know the exact path uh, uh, what should i type when i uh, transferring the files which command uh, i used to so i use the command yeah. uh, print working directory yes. Uh, now, um, let me move this a little bit to the side. And uh, now what I want is um, to get a file from uh, Saga to my laptop. Here I'm going to create a core Date as as in the as I did with the laptop, and I'm going to redirect it from saga.txt. So I have this my file. So I want to send this, Danya. So even when you are doing that, I'm not going to issue the SCP command. But when I have the laptop uh, on my laptop, when I have the file, I use the command. Sorry, the SCP from the laptop to send it. But here I don't issue the SAP command. I use the SAP command from my laptop, but change the order, switch it. So what I want is this file on the on the on the saga, which is uh, from saga. Uh, I'm going to uh, do a small mistake, uh, like you know, purposefully. I'm going to make it capitalize and see what will happen, and then I'm going to uh complete it with a, a full stop which is you know copy it here so when you're copying it uh, maybe it's hard to find so i'm going to create it directly uh, from yeah saga let's say cd saga and there are no files here now so i'm going to use the uh, command here and use this uh full, do you know what this means uh the other uh, the that's at uh... the end the dot mean Linux means the current working directory where uh, any operations will be in the current working directory. Yes, so that will make sure that it will place it here. So when I do that, it lasts for my password. Oops, sorry, uh, I'm going to type it again. And it will um, tell me that there are no files. Uh, but what happened here? You did a mistake. Uh, this uh, file is not existed in on this current uh, the downloads directory on Saga. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what is the mistake? It's use use the capital T X T yeah, extension. Really. Yes. So it is very important that we give the exact path with exact uh, case and exact file. And until you type the password for security reasons, it will not tell you that the file exists or not. After you verified, on, only after that, the, you will get that message. Right, now the file is, let's see the file is here. Cat from Saga. You see it's here. So when I issue the command to get, get it to from send it from Saga, I use this one. And to um, um, to send my file from my laptop to 
Saga, where is that example? And here. And you could uh, you could see the see the comparison here. The order is what makes it from where to where. The reason that we can't send from Saga is there's I don't have a static IP on my laptop. So the Saga, there's no way to identify myself, my home laptop. Uh, in the internet in an un unambiguous way, but Saga is easier. So what we do is we take and send files from my laptop. Um, yeah, so, uh, so Sabi, one question about this. If I ha uh, I can do that if I do, uh, I want to download something from Fram I, and Saga, right? So there yes. is, you know the host name, then if you know the host name, you can use it from anywhere, right? That is true. So this is same, this same technique. You can use it between two clusters as well, from Saga to um, from or Betsy or one of the local clusters. But the, but the concept would be uh, the same. Uh, so I, I recommend that uh, users to try it out while here. Don't go to a breakout room or anything. Try yeah. try this out uh, and and ask questions on the HackMD. Yeah. Before we move to the next. Part. I'll give about, um, yeah, we could, uh, yeah, uh, find uh, like uh, if our colleagues could help with the survey uh, to find out how things are, whether this, so this is like fundamental uh, how you do it, but there are other, more details are there in the, uh, in the teaching material, but what you're going to show is here, but this is what you should sort of understand the basic, then you could go for the, other options okay. that I will mention. Yeah. So, uh, just uh, asking, uh, Sabri, is it the only method to, uh, method we can use to transfer the files, or are there any other programs? So, this is um, sort of the simple one to start with. Yes. But but when you are like transferring big files or many number of files, for example, it's uh, better to uh, use a command called rsync instead. The concept is the same, the, the order, how do you do it, how you mention the um, file locations and etc. cetera. Uh, but um, one advantage of using a command uh, like rsync instead of SCP is it's better at starting from where it left, up, left or left last time. Let's say if you download a file from your laptop or Saga to from or from to Saga or from Saga to a laptop, if it breaks in the middle, rsync will start from the place where it left um, and you know, continue. Uh, and you can use uh, archive mode in that and also you could show the progress. Archive mode means you know it, it, will, um, it will do the archiving part that mentioned later on the lesson automatically without you doing anything. So it will sort of compress things as well. Uh, and then send it to your uh, target location and uncompress it without you doing anything. Okay. Mm, yes. So when we are SCPing, can we uh, 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 transfer a directory instead of a file? Uh, that's a very good question. So the uh, my recommendation is if there's a directory, create archive first with this command and send it as a unit. So it's easier for you to check some, for example. But if you must send a directory with few files, then you have to use the recursive flag in between your file and SCP, dash R. Hmm, let's check the uh, HackMD a little bit. Uh, So we will give a, a five, five, six minutes uh, to someone to try. Be yes, uh, yeah, try it uh, until, uh, let's see the schedule, until the, um, yeah, we are supposed to end at 10, so until 10.15, we'll just uh, keep on talking and we'll look at the um, hack empty to see whether any, any issues that we should show for everybody. Uh, otherwise, try to create a file on your laptop, send it to Saga, and then create a file on Saga and uh, bring it back to your laptop. Yeah. Uh, let's see the questions uh, for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Interpreted literary storing data that. Uh, 
yeah so that's a little uh, re re relevant question as well but nothing to show in general yes this is a good question i think the the quota yeah. question and the du sage would uh, maybe uh, answer in the next more? session and uh, there is a good co course material uh, mm. for that so radovan and thomas will be covering all these mm. places that we can access also i i hope um, so this is a good question, really. So if you if you are on Windows, do you want to use you know easier graphical user interfaces to do these things? Um, so yeah, it's okay. So drag and drops, but underneath there will be things that uh, we mentioned would be working there, SSH, SCP, that sort of things. Uh, but uh, yeah, unless. Um, the thing is, when you use WinSCP or Win, uh, Win FileZilla, for example, you establish a connection between the clusters and you have to make, maintain it and synchronize it, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But with uh, latest Windows 10 versions and also all the other Unix versions, if you just want to transfer one file, it's it. I think it's more convenient to uh, do it on the terminal. Like if you prefer that, it's it depends on your preference. Um, uh, thanks, Tanya. So my name is Thomas Roberts. I work at the uh, University of Bergen, and I'm happy to talk about computer and storage quota. How about you, Hardo? Yeah, I was really looking forward to the session. Hard van Bust, University of Tromsø. And for the next half an hour, we will talk about compute quota and storage quota, why and how, and how to troubleshoot. Yeah. So first question, maybe, what is quota? Why do we need it? Do yeah, we know quota, uh, so why do we need it? Uh, I think I want to go back to this nice analogy yesterday that was, that was introduced with, with the restaurant booking system and with the queue. So if this is a very popular restaurant, then we need to reserve time. We maybe we need to reserve a table. If too many people show up at the same time, then maybe the chefs will be really unhappy because they have to work faster. People will wait a long time for their food. Uh, so that's not a good situation. Also, the other situation is also not good if, if the restaurant prepares for lots of people, but nobody shows up. Um, so we have, we have here systems that can accommodate hundreds or even thousands of users, hundreds of or even thousands of concurrent calculations. And we need a system to make sure that it's not completely overused at the same time or completely underused because we have the resources are limited. But how would you uh, how would you define it? Um, how would you define quota? What it is and why we need it? Yeah. So um, so if you look at the HPC system uh, at start, you may think it's really large system. Yeah? And if you start using it, and you would be the only one then maybe you, you never reach the limits of that system. Yeah, but, uh, and that goes for both uh, using compute time, but also storage. But if you uh, consider that maybe there are many users, hundreds of users, maybe thousands, yeah, then uh, that situation, of course, changes. And so you, you need a way to sort of uh, arrange that uh, maybe users or projects who need a lot of resources to many uh, a lot of compute time or uh, much storage that can get, get this uh, and then also some fairness uh, among the users so, so that uh, everyone uh, can progress uh, and uh, also in case um, that maybe you do, do a little mistake or so and uh, suddenly the whole system is blocked yeah, so that is a situation you don't we want to avoid yeah and Quarter is a means to uh, to uh, to split a large system up into chunks, so and everyone is then free uh, to do whatever they want in their chunk. Yes, and I mean nobody, of course, enjoys waiting, but it's it's a good compromise so that you once you get the allocated slot, you can run your job and are not affected by other users. I can also yeah. tell the anecdote that in two thousand two. I have managed to fill the entire cluster disk because I made a mistake. There was no quota. I filled it up. Everything stopped. And um, this was really embarrassing. 
And this would not have happened if a storage quota was in place. Okay, so maybe we can have a look into um, assessment. Uh, look how, um, what kind of quota we have. So let me uh, have a look into compute quota. Okay, so I guess now you see also the, the prompt. So I'm here on Saga. And if I want to know how much compute quota I have, uh, then I have a command called cost. Yeah. Um, and if you type this, then depending on how many uh, how uh, many projects you have access to, you see a uh, few lines or, or many lines. Yeah? So here there's a lot, there's many lines. Uh, so I limit us a little bit to just what we have for the um, pr uh, course. And now we have uh, not so many lines. And I just go through all these lines a little bit there and uh, explain what they mean. So the first line here tells you this is the output is for a specific allocation period. Maybe you have heard this before. Yeah, so we, uh, for the compute time, we have allocation periods. Uh, it's always like a year and then one or two. And uh, one uh, always runs from 1st of April to 1st of October, and two runs from 1st of October to 1st of uh, April, so always six months. Yeah. And the information you see here is just, has it just been updated, yeah? Uh, that's just the current time when I ran this command. And then you see information about uh, an account, yeah? so that's always here, uh, this project account I used here for the command. And then uh, you see some separate um, attributes. Uh, and then you see on the, the right uh, column, you see the CPU hours. And yeah, so that is, uh, let's say, you could, you could understand these 20,000 here. Uh, that's what you get, got allocated for this project. As you could uh, run uh, jobs uh, um, consuming one CPU hours uh, for, so if you would, for example, you could run 20,000 jobs or you could run maybe one job uh, consuming uh, 20,000 uh, CPU hours. Yeah? And you, there's a lot of flexibility um, how, uh, what kind of jobs you can run. It's not just that you can only run one job, uh, one job or, or 20,000 jobs, uh, depends a bit on the size of the job and we will look into this uh, a bit later on. Can I just intercept here with uh, just a few yeah. clarifications or questions? So one question that somebody might have is that the cost command, is that the Unix command? And the answer is no, it's not. This is not something that will exist on your laptop. The cost is a command that we have we have created to give you this to give you this overview. So this is something that that works on Enris clusters, but may not work on other clusters. Yes. Then um, one might also ask why this allocation period of six months, why can't we get an allocation for an arbitrary amount of time? Why do we have this? I mean, I can also answer, but... Yes, um, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, so I yeah don't know. well, I can say that it's a practical reason because uh, because there is a there is a committee that actually looks at applications and the committee meets twice a year because it the committee will take several days to review the applications based on technical requirements academic scientific requirements so this is the reason on, on a system like of this size there is a bit of rigidity also we got via zoom chat we got uh, we got asked whether we could increase font size yes sure and also that the audio quality is a bit rough. So I have to say that on my side, it sounds good, but maybe my audio quality is rough. Uh, and my sound is, yes. on my side also is great, uh, perfect uh, audio quality. Sometimes there's a bit instability in, of the network. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yes. So I can hear you well. And everyone is frozen. Hmm. Good, but we got these 20,000 CPU hours allocated. Um, and when we applied for this quota, we also indicate what we want to use it for. But as you said, there is a bit of freedom then to, to use it in different ways. Is Thomas still, still here?
Okay. Am I still here? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's good. Maybe you can continue. Uh, I can see Thomas and the participants list, but uh, maybe connecting. All right, let me see if I can take over here. Yep. Ah, Thomas is back. So I need, okay, so sorry, my network sometimes is a bit unstable. Okay, um, yeah. I don't know what you, you said. So uh, on your, also on other systems, you see uh, different allocation periods, longer periods. Uh, I don't think you see a shorter allocation period, yeah, but yeah, that's for us. Um, yeah, so we got the quota. I think what is important to say is that at the end of the allocation period, you cannot, if you don't use it up, you cannot take it to the next period. So then things are reset. Yeah. You, you apply yeah. for a new quota and we restart. So, and, and what you see is your different uh, sort of, you have two different types of quota, prioritized and non-prioritized. So non-prioritized, so normally you get prioritized quota, but uh, non-prioritized you, you get when you ask for additional quota within a period. Yeah, or if you forgot for some reason to send the application by the deadline, then you may also get non-prioritized quota. Uh, and uh, the, the difference in the scheduling of jobs is that uh, uh, non-prioritized jobs uh, have to wait a bit longer in the queue. I think something like maybe 12 hours or so longer uh, before they uh, advance, uh, start advancing in the queue. So then what you see here is how many CPU hours you have uh, used uh, yeah, in for this project, how many CPU hours are reserved by jobs that are currently running, how many um, CPU hours are reserved by jobs that are pending, meaning a waiting in the queue, and how many uh, CPU hours you have still left. Yeah, so of the 20,000 uh, CPU hours for this uh, training course project, we have still uh, almost uh, all CPU hours left. Yeah? So that's everything maybe to explain this cost command. Let's so see. then uh, after this course, people, if people are excited about high performance computing and they want their own quota or more quota, what can they do? How, how can they apply for initial quota? How can they apply for more quota? Yes. Um, so we have here in the uh, course material, we have a link. Uh, so, uh, and there's uh, described how you can apply uh, for a quota. And um, so basically you have to apply for project. Uh, and um, there are, I think there are deadlines always, um, I think in January and uh, in August or so uh, for the next uh, allocation period. Yeah, and also what you also mentioned here, sometimes it's unclear to you how much quota you actually need. Yeah? Uh, then you can also contact us um, at the support um, to provide some assistance and, and figuring out how much quota you need. Okay. Um, okay. So I think we already answered this question: How for how long I can use the compute quota? It's always for this allocation period, and what you have not used within a period is not taken uh, transferred to the next period. Um, uh, so, so then, an interesting question is: How is compute quota being consumed? Yeah. So that um, by running jobs, you consume a quota. And uh, each job um, uses different types of resources, yeah. uh, CPU cores, GPUs maybe, uh, and RAM, so memory. And um, uh, for, uh, so how much of these uh, types of resources are requested by a job uh, then uh, determines how uh, much a job is built. And let's say you ask for a runtime of 10 hours, but the job only runs for two hours, then you're only built for the use of um, two hours. But let's say you ask for 10 CPUs, CPU cores, but you only use one for whatever reason in your uh, job, yeah? uh, then you are still built for 10 CPU hours, uh, sorry, uh, 10 CPUs, because um, the scheduler reserves these 10 CPUs for your job uh, and no one else can use these uh, um, 10 CPUs at the time when your job is running. Yeah, so that you should be aware of. And that's Want a very say? important point because um, uh, yesterday we learned how to submit jobs. I think we have not discussed to ask how many cores we want in a job. 
but you can ask Slurm to for let's say 60 cores. And at some point Slurm will, will give you these cores. But that doesn't mean necessarily that your program will actually use these 60 cores, but you will get built for them. So or you will get built for the resources that you block. Hopefully these are also the resources that you use, but it's uh, this is really good to verify. And we will come back to that question in our follow-up workshop at the end of the month. And mm -hmm. the, the other really important thing that Thomas mentioned is that if I ask for five days, but the calculation finishes after one hour, I don't pay for the five days, but I pay for the one hour. Mm -hmm. So is there any disadvantage for me to ask for five days just to be on the safe side, to not time out? Any, any questions, any disadvantage? Yeah, is there any disadvantage to that? Oh. Yes, yeah, so there, there are two possible disadvantages. So one is that you have, your job has maybe to wait long, long in the queue until it gets started. And the second one is um, that let's say maybe your your um, there's some mistake in the in the uh, job, yeah, and it it doesn't do what you want, uh, and it, then it, it doesn't stop, yeah, and then it would only be stopped by the scheduler when the uh, runtime expires. Uh, so you would build would be built for the whole uh, five days and not just for I don't know ten seconds until you the error uh, occurs. Yeah, so that could be a, a disadvantage. Good point. And there is one more little subtle risk with billing units. And the question to Thomas is, is there any risk of me inheriting job scripts from, from past generations? I mean, this is something that happens in every research group. You and you come, you are the new master student, PhD student postdoc, and you get some run scripts from your colleagues. And if they don't crash, then you are happy and you continue using them. But is there any risk in doing this in terms of billing units? Yes, yes. I, I forgot what kind of risk. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, th I'm thinking in terms of actually memory. <laughs> so what if I, I got a, I don't go script from a colleague and it asks for well, too much memory, but I, I don't know what that means. It doesn't crash and I continue using that. And I ask only for one processor. I ask for one core and I only use one core. But I may be surprised that now the that in once I look at my cost, that suddenly all my all my quota went away. So how come? Yeah, yeah. So um, there could be um, the the situation that let's say you you ask for one core, but you ask for a lot of memory, uh, and to uh, ensure fairness uh, in the system, um, you are not only built for uh, or not directly built for us uh, for the CPU cores you're asking for, but for some, so like, let's say abstract uh, resource, and um, this is calculated in a certain way. So that, um, CPUs uh, always account for one, uh, let's say, unit of resource, uh, and uh, memory also accounts for a unit of resource. And there's some conversion factor for each um, uh, system partition. Or on the, so on Saga, we have different partitions, and for different partitions, we have different conversion factors for memory. And all is uh, that described also in the documentation. Maybe we should not go into too much detail, but you have to understand if, let's say, you ask for 50 gigabytes of memory for one job and only one core, then you are built as, let's say, approximately 11 cores, as if you would use 11 cores. Yeah? So your sort of your, your spending for this job is 10 times higher as you may think. Yeah? And so that's uh, important to know. Okay, so let maybe we should. Okay, uh, so this we uh, touch a little bit on this. What can I do when my compute quota is consumed? Then um, basically the only thing you can do is asking for more uh, quota. Uh, and, and then if you do this uh, within an uh, allocation period and they get more additional quota, then you get this non prioritized quota. If you let's say close to the end of the allocation period or just before the deadline for application uh, uh, um, for a new quarter for the next period, then you can ask for a more uh, quarter and get normal quarter. And there's also a link uh, in the documentation uh, for how to do this. Sounds so now good. I wonder whether we should move on to storage quota. We have 10 minutes left yeah. in this session. 
Also, yeah. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the HackMD. Not too many questions coming in. Please yeah, I don't hesitate to ask questions. Or should I do something? Oh, just, wait a sec. Let me see if I can take it from you. Oh, I can't. I think you need to stop first. Okay. Now, okay. good sharing. And for the next 10 minutes, let's move on to um, storage quota. So we, we talked about compute quota. Let's talk about storage quota. I want to maybe start here by saying that on the different clusters, we have different storage areas. When, when you SSH and you log in into Saga, you arrive in your home area. This is a certain quota. We will look at how much that is and how you can inspect that. But there are different areas. There is a so-called user work on at least maybe on all of these clusters. There is also project data storage. And if you want to know more, here's a link to our documentation page and there is a lot more info on the pros and cons of these different storage spaces. I think I want to start by going directly into a problem. I think sooner or later, you might see this, this quota exceeded. This might happen when once while you're working, it might also happen in your job. The job can suddenly stop and then you see somewhere that it was not able to write. And now how do we diagnose it? We have, a, I think we have a feeling of what it means. We filled up the quota. How can we diagnose it? What can we do about it? And what I will do is I will open here my terminal and I will try these things out. What you can do is if you want, you can also open up a terminal and try these commands as well. On, on Saga, you can also have on one side of your screen my terminal, on the other side, HackMD and ask questions. So let me log in to Saga. I will make the website go away to have more space. Slight rearrangement on my windows. SSH Saga Sigma 2. I should also add my username. Let's go in. And hmm. now the, the one command that you can all test out which, which is the first command that I do whenever I see this, this quota exceeded, we have a command called dusage, which gives you, which will print you how much quota have you consumed. And we have this command on, on all our clusters. This is also not a Unix command that you find on, on your laptop. This is, this is a program that we have written. Let's see how it looks. And I think here I need to do something with my font size because it wraps around. So I wonder what is the best thing. I can either make the screen share more wide or I can make the font smaller. I'm not sure what is the better thing to do. Is this readable or should I make the aspect different of my, of my share? This is readable by the Okay. On Saga. So the, you can try it out on any of our clusters. I can see, so the command was the usage. It doesn't modify anything. It gives you only information. It's a safe command to do. It's also something that you can add in your job script, maybe at the beginning of your job and at the end of your job. So for the different spaces where I have access to, it tells me what is my quota? This is how much can I have in this space? So you can see that home is almost, my home is almost full because I actually almost filled it up because I wanted to show, to show you something. We have a quota on the size. We also have a quota on the number of files or the number of inodes or the number of chunks. I don't want to go into too much details. I think it's good to think about it as number of files. So I cannot have, I cannot, it will prevent me from having too, too big files. This will prevent me from having too many files. So in my home, there is a limit of 100,000. And it's actually easy to hit that limit. And we will discuss that. Now, I want to show you one thing that, so if you get this quota exceeded, first thing you try is the usage. And hopefully then you understand why that is, but it can be tricky. 
and I can show you what one of the difficulties is to diagnose this. I have a folder and I created some files, some large, artificially large files. And now let me copy this large file into another large file. And the usage, let's ask the usage again. And I'm actually now beyond quota. And that's maybe a little bit weird, so how come? And one, one difficulty that we have is that uh, there can be a little bit of a lag between going over quota and experiencing its effect. In my experience, it's something like 10, 15 minutes, depending on the file system state. Thomas, please correct me if... So depending on the cluster, depending on the day, it can be either immediate, but there can be a few minutes between going overboard and experiencing the error message. Yeah. This can make yeah. debugging a bit tricky. It, de it depends on the uh, workload on the file system. So if yeah. there are many operations, then it can take a, a while until you actually hit this exit seated message. Yeah, so it can happen that you your job stops, you filled up the quota, but then later the temporary files got removed, you run or oh, there was a little bit of a delay, you run the usage and everything looks good here. And you ask yourself, so what, why did that happen? So one recommendation is maybe in your job, if that happened to you ever, maybe place in your job at the beginning and at the end the usage, because then you have the information at the time when it happened. So what happens when you, when you copy it again? Uh, when I copy again, let's copy to another one. Aha, uh -huh, here we go. So now I got this, I already can't copy anymore. So I filled up the quota. Now the usage, what can I do now? What is the recovery? Um, I might be tempted now to, I see that here my quota is full, but I have these other spaces. I have this thing where I have unlimited quota, wow, nice. So what if I move the files into this other space? But watch out, this one is not picked up. Will that help? It will maybe help, um, depending on the machine. So that's another thing that makes it a little bit tricky, is that if I know, should I try that just as a demo? If let's let's move one of the gigantic files, this one, let, let me move it over to my to this space. Okay, is there? Is it gone? Yes, it's gone from here. And now let's ask the usage again. And that it still tells me that I'm here on, I'm exceeding home. How is that even possible? If I ask du minus sh. Maybe there's again some lag. In how it could be a lag. This is a Linux command. This is a different, this is a built-in Unix command to ask how much space is occupied in this place. So that's, if I ask this command, what will I see? So this command tells me that I'm occupying 12 gigabyte in my home, but the usage tells me that I'm still occupying 20. So this is another, another thing that really confuses users. It makes it, it makes diagnosing, debugging this a little bit harder. The reason why what happened is that, uh, this is the reason, let me show you. The reason is that on Saga and From, what matters for quota is the group of a file, the group ownership. And if I, when I move a file from one place to another, I don't change the group ownership. If I would go in here and have a look at this big file, it would still belong to this, to, to this to this group here. So one way to can fix you, it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Can you show this? Hopefully, I'm a bit nervous to find what I see in this other folder. Let's see. <laughs> let's see. Uh, I was it was here, and let's make that a little bit safer. Yeah. So in this other space, this thing this thing still belongs to this group. So how can I? Solve this now. What other what what group should I give it to? 
I, I can change that with there is this command called change group and I can give it a different group. Now I don't know which group I should give it to. I think I would know rather in, in a project space, I will, so if you move a file into a project space, then you should also give it the project group. And then suddenly everything will look, look nicely here. In, on this website here, I, we list a couple of, we explain why this can be a little bit surprising and how you can recover from it. So moving may, may not be enough. If you moved, you also need to change the group. The other thing you can do is you can move and wait until the next day. And then suddenly it will look good again. And how come, how is that? Because we have overnight scripts that fix the group permissions for you. They run every night. So if I wait long enough, it will look good again. The other option to recover is to copy files and delete them. So if I had copied, to a project space and I would have deleted them in my home space, it would have behaved as I expected. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Can you move the file back? <laughs> An exercise, <laughs> changing the script. Uh, move back from, from here to home. Mm -hmm. Let's try. Mm -hmm. Yep, I can. Okay, and, and now you can copy it. And I could copy here to here. Probably takes a bit more time. Probably because now it needs to copy these 10 gigabytes. Okay, if you're copying and taking a lot of time, uh, can you uh, <laughs> look at this HackMD document? There is a question number 20. Right, looking number 20. Yeah. I ran the usage on Betsy, but I don't see in the output. Am I missing something? I do have some files stored in the folder. So you are not missing anything on Betsy. Betsy is different than from and Saga. It's, it is the same file system implementation as on from, but a different version. So these problems that we discuss here, they don't exist on Betsy. On Betsy, it behaves, it's easier. If you move, if you move files away, the quota adapts mm. as you would expect. And, and we are also soon hitting here end of time. Okay, so here it's copied now. So you could you could check um, the, the file just a minute. Okay, let's do that. Let's let's see what here. Mm -hmm. Now the permission, the group permission changed, mm -hmm. and I could now remove it in. I can remove it in my. Oh, it was dangerous. Uh, I can remove it in my home, and if I now ask the usage, it will tell me that home looks good. I'm now below quota. Um, since we are really almost out of time, I want to mention one, one very common thing that many of you who use Conda or Python, Anaconda, probably will hit, is that if you install your Conda environment into your home folder, you will easily fill up these 100,000 files. And well, recommendation is do not install Conda environment into your home. Or install it into your project space. They have more space or into your user work. With a Conda environment, you cannot, I don't think you can easily copy or move it. What I would do is I would create, the recovery would be, I could create a new Conda environment in a project space or my user work. And I would delete the old one, the incomplete, the one that filled up my quota in the home. But when you install something into your user work, you just have to be aware that it's uh, automatically removed after some time. Yes. 20 days. So. Oh, oh, oh that's, that's important. So which one is it, this one? This gets automatically yeah. removed? Yeah, after 21 days. Uh... Okay, that's good to know. So I, uh, that, that we need to also add to, the, to our documentation. So let's be careful about not putting any precious things into into this one. So it's unlimited, but it things expire after 21 days. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's already there. Uh, maybe if, uh, if nothing changed since last uh, four months. Uh, but is it 42 days or 21 days, uh, Thomas? I, I think it's safer to assume 21 days. Okay, then you're dead. Uh, but it can be that um, it, you think it's 
42 days uh, and then uh, the file system fills up uh, and the change is done when the file system uh, reaches a certain uh, threshold, yeah, the whole file system. And if that is done, then sort of this, that time is suddenly reduced to 21 days. So it, it could be that uh, your files get, are lost quickly, yeah? Mm -hmm. So better, better assume 21 days, that's uh, safer. Yeah, and if none of this works, if none of none of these fit your use case, contact us and talk to us. Also, there may be situations where we can give you more home quota or more project quota. So take home message from this storage quota session was that the usage is your friendly command, but there can be a little bit of time delay between experiencing, between filling up the quota and experiencing the effects. And on Fram and Saga, you need to be careful about group ownership. This also holds for those of you who use rsync. If you use rsync, you can inadvertently also create this issue because also rsync sets group permissions. So verify what it what it really does. Did I forget anything? Are we are we happy with the session? What what did we miss? Here are some key points. Uh, so there's one uh, follow-up question on this uh, removal. Uh, so there is no information uh, before files are removed. Yeah. But I need to adopt this. So we should not put the condo environment into user work in this case. It would not be a good idea. So it should go into the project work. <coughs> so if, you, if, it. You, if you only need it for 21 days, then it's make fine. Yeah. True. Good. Okay, Rado, yeah, maybe you can have an, a minute to break uh, before you continue, or would you like to continue with the next session? Yeah, I would just like to, like one minute, I will refill my glass of water. Everybody okay. can get a breather, and we will then switch over to, we will talk about how to ask questions and how to answer questions in an effective way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe one final comment. Uh, so whenever you hit any issue with quota, um, for compute quota or storage quota, it's always very good to just run very quickly the, these commands cost or the usage uh, to get in, uh, the, the status when this happens. Yeah, because uh, it can happen that uh, status changes uh, um, until you uh, see the error or so, maybe it was in a job. And then late the next morning, you see this, uh, yeah, then the, the situation could have already, already changed. And then it's difficult to investigate what, what was the cause of this. Yeah, so it's always good to, to run these commands uh, as soon as possible. And for example, if it happens, could happen in a job, as Radovan said, uh, running this D usage command at the beginning of each job, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. I think. Right, great. Thanks, Thomas, also for, for the session. Yeah. And for clarifications. I learned a lot while also preparing this. I didn't know all these things. So this was very useful. Let's okay. see what we have planned next. We have next is, I'll just close all these terminals here. Um, in, in the schedule, is it now the last session before the Q&A discussion? It's yeah. Yes. This one, how to ask for help, and Jan will be here with me. Yeah. This time it's it's slides. So we have some slides. I think it's the only only place. So there won't be any there won't be any exercises. There won't be any type along. Um, maybe the best way to participate is to ask lots of questions, give comments on HackMD. I will have an eye on that, and Jan will have an eye on it. What I also don't know is what is the best way to share it. I can. I can resize my window to be more more landscape. If so, let me know if if it's too narrow, too hard to read. You can also open up these slides on on, on your end. Um, the goal of this. Um, so now we have twenty minutes, and there are twenty five slides. We will. I will not go through all of them, but we we want to discuss here with you on what are recommendations on how you. How can you ask for help with things, with supercomputers, uh, when and how? Let me know if the font is too small on the narrow share. 
So what kind of help is available? Well, when to ask for help? Well, every time when in doubt. It's also about how to write support requests so that you get quick and useful answers. How to, how to create reproducible examples. And it's the goal is that you, we improve your, our experience. Um, it's not only, this goes both ways. It also goes, it's for us staff to how to answer questions really in a, in a respectful way. Some slide about me, let's skip. Um, this is based on, this presentation is based on other presentations and other material, which I acknowledge and point you to read more if you're interested. Let's start here. This is a slide where, so there are many places where I could ask for help. I can ask in the corridor colleagues. We have, we have monthly Q&A sessions in in Enris, maybe we can add a link. I think we have a yeah, link. We can, also show the, we can also show the page later, maybe. Yeah, let me actually, maybe let me show you so that you know whether this documentation, Sigma to the demo, this is. I mean, this is probably one of the best resources for help we can offer, except for like directly asking. Yeah. So have a look at the documentation. Here, open questions and answer session for all users. So this is something we do roughly monthly. This is something that Jörn leads. It's a lot of fun. We have always five to 10 people showing up. Oh, we had more. We had 15. Not so oh, long ago. Super. Yeah, great. So there will be the next one is, uh, is it next week? Next week, uh, next week Tuesday. Yeah, next week, Tuesday. Um, so if you, let's say, you now you learned a bit, you try stuff out. And at some point in the future, maybe this week, maybe in a month or so, you have some problem, but, or you have like general questions, or you want to give us some feedback, or you are a bit unsure, but you don't know how to say that in a ticket because tickets are a bit more formal, um, or you just want to see what other people do. Um, join us. It's from one o'clock till three, roughly. If there's no one at 2.30, then we will just close it. And it usually starts with like a 10 minute like info about some kind of topic. You can see the old topics. So sometimes it's like about help resources, about another HPC cluster. It's about something we think might be interested for users. Um, and this time it will also be a bit about like, like resources to find help. And afterwards you can ask all the questions and there's a lot of stuff from uh, Envis and we will try to help you as much as possible. And Put you either in a breakout room or discuss it in public. It depends also what you want. Yeah, and you don't have to you don't have to be there for the whole two hours. Also, if you don't have time for one to three, and you only have time at two o'clock, then pop in at two o'clock. So this is really low key. Show up, ask questions. It's also a great way for us to listen to uh, what is working, what is not working, what is bothering. Little paper cuts that we can improve. So there is this. The main thing is this. The other main thing is email send an email it will open an um, issue or ticket on our side of course there are many more ways there is there are different mailing list forums stack exchange i have sorted them a little bit in increasing um i don't know like i'm increasingly worried about using the ones below because or some people may be because if i ask the question that i'm uncomfortable with here everybody can see it but here Nobody can see it. I can just ask it, colleagues. And also here, the email goes just between you and the staff. But there are so many different options. Good, let's move on. It's really, this is important slide for me, is that it's really important to remember who is on the other side. There is a human being on the other side. <clears throat> and we have to remember that the staff, also it's good to know for so for those who answer for our staff, it's important that we remember it is not easy to ask for help. The person asking for help has maybe 20 years less experience with Unix. They have a lot more experience in other fields. The person on the other side has perhaps spent weeks on this problem and is now waiting days or weeks for my answer. I have to remember to be always respectful. And even if I write just three lines of emails, it's so easy to to, to have it sound wrong. So this is something we need to remember and improve. For those of you who send us emails, good to know that the staff 
on support duty is rotating every few weeks. It's not always the same people, actually. Every week is different people. They don't know everything. They are experts in their own fields, but they may not be spending all the time on the supercomputer either. They may not know you and they may not have the context because they, they came in this week. Last week, they did something completely different. And they may not have full context of this issue, which may be which we are working on since weeks. Yeah, also we are, we are like usually around five persons who are like having a look on the uh, on the incoming tickets and support requests. So and like for me, I usually don't work that much on the system myself. I'm more I do other stuff around. So sometimes I'm I, I'm also a bit like a philosopher, like a beginner, because I don't remember the simple commands when I go back to try something out. So we. We try to look into our tickets. Um, we follow up with the tickets we take during the week usually, but um, there's a lot of rotation. Mm -hmm. so. so we try our best. There is really always room for improvement. We try to improve. Um, I remember the first answer, the answer to my first ever technical email request many, many years ago. So I wrote this long novel because I wanted to be really polite paragraphs and paragraphs where I motivated why I would benefit so much from, I wanted access to some software. This was before GitHub and before open source. And a few days later, I got a very short email back. Uh, hi, I guess what you meant asking in between all those paragraphs was, can I please get the code X? Yes, here it is. So I felt a bit silly, um, but I wanted to do the, <laughs> I wanted to be really, really polite, but I think I was, I think it was not clear from this, all this novel that I have written what I really wanted. So how can we, uh, how can we improve the experience for both sides? Uh, Jan mentioned that, so the tickets issues. So whenever you send us an email, it will open something that we call a ticket or an issue on our side. We get 10 to 30 such emails every day. It, it opens every new email, opens up a new ticket with a new number, and then we can refer to the number. So, so there is a bit of a threat on our side. When next week, when there is new support staff, they can still read up on the, on the history of the ticket. Each ticket, each issue has an owner, but owners may change. And the first thing that we see is the email subject. And that can already help us sorting it to the right person. So it's good if that subject is descriptive. Problem is not a very descriptive subject. This one is better. I already have an idea what's going on. Okay, somebody has a job crashing. You can also include keywords in your subject, like what is the code, what is maybe your research field. If if you if you have a new problem. You may be tempted to reply to this other email because you go into your email and you find, aha, I was discussing here with Jon, and I will just reply to Jon and ask about this new problem. But that makes it a little bit hard on, on our side because the risk is that your question gets lost because it, get fi it, it gets filed to the, to the old issue. So new problem, new email. But also if it's the same problem, then then don't, don't write a fresh email to support at nris.no, but reply to the existing thread because that makes it easier to organize it on our side. Uh, sometimes it's of course like difficult. Is it a new problem or is it an old problem? Yeah. Sometimes we will ask you to open a new ticket if we, if we think it's something completely different. Like maybe before it was a problem with the software, now it's a new software you actually need. Mm. Because these, we don't want to get these like email threads out of like that they got like enormously long with like multiple questions interviewed and so. yeah and sometimes it's the same problem but was sent in two separate emails and then they they arrived to two different people and then we also don't work all in the same corridor I mean some of us are in Tromso and in Trondheim Oslo and Bergen and then we also need to find out that two people are actually trying to solve the same problem. And a few things that can help us is to provide some context, you, like, like your username. I mean, we can find it out, but it's it takes a couple of minutes and it's not the most exciting work. 
so if you give if you give us a username, it already helps. Also, using explicit path is better than than tilde slash implicit path because that refers to your home. But I don't know what your home is. I need to find it out. It helps to know which of the which of the three four different clusters, which software, maybe even which research field. I think the machine is particularly important because sometimes users are parts of projects that have access to multiple clusters. And then you have to guess, is it like Saga or Fram in this case? Sometimes I can guess from the context. Sometimes I just have to ask and then it takes longer for everyone. Yeah. Also tell us about your environment. Um, earlier today, we talked about modules. So if you, if you didn't load your modules in a run script, Maybe you load them in Bash RC. So tell tell us about your environment so that we can reproduce it. Is there anything special about your environment? Sometimes text is better than screenshot because from a text I can copy text from a screenshot I can't. Sometimes attachments are better than screenshots, but screenshots are better than nothing. So there is nothing. It's it's good to attach something. Um, here, a few recommendations. Uh, it's mm -hmm. always good to not just describe what didn't work, but just like actually like show us a line that didn't work. Because sometimes you get the output, but not the input line. You don't know what you mm -hmm. did to get this output. And then it's sometimes like guesswork. And yeah. Speaking of guesswork, we also sometimes have to guess whether this is the first time that, like, has it ever worked before? And it started crashing now since Monday? Or has it never worked? I mean, this is nice to know, but um, this information is sometimes not provided. It can already be helpful because then we know better. Is this something we messed up or is this something that has never worked and we need to get it to work for the first time? Also, what are you trying to accomplish? Not your really your ultimate goal and not only the current technical obstacle. This is, again, a bit more context and I will come back to that. Also, right, what did you try? What did you try so far? Um, this this can help us to narrow things down. Okay, just want to give a pause here for have a look at anything on HackMD. Not yet. We have ten uh, minutes. a little bit. Um, someone wrote. Uh, can you mention again how to open a new ticket? Do you mean by writing an email, or is there a link where you have to go? So, uh, what we usually mean is you write an email to support at Envis.no. You will find it also on the on our. Um, document page. Um, I think I first on the start page and also on the getting help support line. Yeah, so there is the support line with some text recommendations, but by sending email to support at nris.no, it will open up a ticket on our side. We also, some of the things that we discuss here with Jan, they are also written here on the documentation. Good. But do not hesitate to 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 ask. Um, but also, I when I'm getting an email, I do appreciate when I see that the person asking spent more than just two minutes on it. So not immediately problem, immediately email. But it's nice to see that what did the person try? Because it will avoid a lot of back and forth. But again, a reminder for the staff. The person asking may not know yet how to look for solutions before asking. So we, we should help them to show how to look for help. And instead of, I mean, I could passively aggressively send a link hmm. to documentation. Or, or a Google or, link, that's I think the best, yeah. the most okay. aggressive way of sending. Like. Yeah. like, let me Google that for you, but that's not, <laughs> yeah. a, that's not a nice way. I mean, we, we need to start with empathy. Let's work together. And instead of just making people feel like I'm going through a checklist. Let's go through the checklist together and show them how 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 would I solve it? What would I try? What have I found so that we learn together? Because if we ask these checklist questions, it can make users feel like they are annoying, they help this person. And that's really not what we want. And also I can understand like sometimes there's questions which I, I read and then I Google and then I have the solution. But I mean yeah. I often also have my, I, I know my context in the background, I know what to Google for, and I recognize often the solutions if I've seen the problem already. So I just have to find the exact solution, but I know how it looks. Yes. And so I 
is just to, sometimes we just Google and have the solution, but this is not necessarily that you did something wrong. Yeah, and sometimes the solution on web is wrong because it's not mm -hmm. suitable. Sometimes you find on the web on the web well you can solve it by sudo apt-get install something something, and that will not work on on the cluster. Yeah. So don't hesitate to ask. Um, X Y problem is frequent. What does that mean? It means that I'm a user. I want to do something. And I think that to achieve what I want to do, I need to do this. I need that this solution Y is the way to achieve what I want to do. And I try it and it fails. And then I write to the support and tell them, well, I tried this and I, it crashed. But I never told anybody what I really wanted to do. So then we spent a couple of days or weeks solving the problem. And then later we realized that the thing that we solved is not it's not even the best solution for what you really wanted to do. So tell us, tell us what you really have in mind. This, um, for, this could, for example, mean you have you have some problem and you find like, okay, there's this package I need, and then you want to install it. And then on our cluster, this is kind of might be a bit more complicated, and then we run into troubles, and then we try to solve the whole installation process to in the end realize I there is another software which might be new, modern, more modern or Hmm. more suitable for our systems like for example if you want a docker container we can't we can't provide docker but we have something very similar which is compatible but in this case we would immediately notice but sometimes it's more like you try to install something you do a lot of effort we do have a lot of effort and then it's like ah there's a much much thick like quicker solution yeah. okay five minutes left i will jump over the next slide but i want to here i have two two example requests and I want to show you them. And I will ask Jörn in a moment what, what Jörn likes about this one. So hi, I'm, I'm user so-and-so on, on Cluster Saga. And since this morning, I can't log in anymore. What I've tried is I tried to log in into Framid Betsy, and this works. I use SSH keys to log in. And the error that I get since this morning is this one. Thanks in advance for helping advice how to solve this. So what do you like about this request? What is nice? Yeah, what, I, what I like is immediately clear the username and the, uh, the server you, you want to use. What you want to use and what is really helpful in this case is that I know, okay, it works for the other cluster, uh, the other clusters. So it, it's not one of the typical, there's something broken on your uh, SSH or your key is whatever. It's not one of these like simpler solutions where it's just like the whole system is broken itself. It's, um, and you show us um, the SLH command, so the input, and also the output. And that helps a lot. Yeah, we see the error message. I can also see that the user has tried something, has tried to log into the other clusters that work. So it's probably not, from this, I can see that the user knows how to use SSH. It's also something that probably changed this morning. And what I would probably think figure just from reading this email that well maybe it's something we did or, or a firewall or no wait a moment so there's no actually just from this error message i would see that maybe something changed only on saga with a specific file about public key so we get a lot of information just from this one email and we avoid a lot of back and forth you will probably get a solution really quickly let's go to the next example and again i will ask you on what he likes about it so this in this example Hi, I'm not sure I wrote to the right support. But, but what I'm looking for is a virtual machine where I can install some PHP web server and some database. What, I have, what we have in mind is a service where we can share the data from our recent study. It can be fully public. It's about 2,000 records, so it's not much. And we would like to create a web front end where people can search through and plot our data. Yeah, looking forward to hearing from you. So what do you like about this one? Um, what I like is that the motivation is clear because uh, it's not only that you want to install a PHP web service in MySQL database, which is like the immediate problem they're trying to solve, but also why, what, what like the bigger underlying motivation is. Yeah. And that helps a lot because just from the first, I, I might, I mean, I just actually recently tried it at MySQL database and this is a pain um, on our systems. Um, and then I could tell you and I could show you stuff, but in the end, 
if I read the, this, the second paragraph, I know, ah, I think our servers are not like the ideal solution. There's something else I can offer you. It's, there's a much nicer way of doing what you want to do than what you are trying to do actually at this moment. Yes, so it's really good that the person sent this request. It's not a big problem that it went to the wrong one. I mean, we will help channeling it to the right support line. It's very good that the person provided more context. It's actually a real email that I got. And what we figured out uh, after discussing with the person is that this was not the best solution for this problem, for whatever reason. I mean, we have we have solved it differently, but we, we wouldn't know if we didn't know this context. So this was very helpful. We have not too much time left. Hmm. Well, let me maybe selectively show only one or two slides. And the, the one of the two slides I want to show is this one. It's incredibly helpful for you and for the staff if you experience a problem or you are new on a machine and you want to now move your computation from some other cluster over to Betsy, create a small example and grow it. So if you have a, if you experience an issue, make the example as small as possible and reproducible, make it fail as early as possible. Uh, tell us how long it takes until it fails. Does it always fail the same way? Does it fail randomly? If it fails after two seconds, do not request 48 hours because also for us, it's really boring to, to wait for a job to queue. If it fails, it crashes immediately. If this is an interactive job, it's really helpful to provide all commands from, from login to the problem. Okay, on these slides, we will find more. Since we are out of time, I want to fast forward to, to the summary slide. You are not alone. There are different ways to, to get help. In, in our context here, maybe the two best ways is sending an email or joining one of the Q&A sessions. If you report a problem, you are probably not alone. So it's nice that you do it because you help all those who, are, who don't know how to report it or are maybe a little bit too worried to report it. Questions are not stupid and many people really enjoy helping. And it's also nice from time to time we get this email that somebody writes that this actually really worked well. It's a nice, uh, it's refreshing. So this is also sometimes nice to hear when things do work well. So it doesn't always have to be a problem. Um, what did we forget to say, Jan? I don't know. I think it's, yeah, please don't feel like, even so sometimes you complain about user tickets. I mean, that's our job. We want to hear your problems and we want to help you. And um, so take advantage of our, the other, oh, first we are not only have like the documentation on the support line, but we also have the Q&A session. Uh, we have these courses. I mean, you took the right choice and joining now and hope you will find, uh, think it's helpful. Um, and if you have the feeling we, we could offer something or you're missing something or something is not well explained, then also just write us an email. Like if the documentation is really like confusing for you as a beginner, because it's actually really hard for us to write good documentation because we, are, we have been in this like mindset for so long that something I, I, I write state stuff and then I think, oh, it's like that I explained it really well. And then I like, talk to it about with some new user and then I realized, okay, it was all way too complicated. Uh, or I assumed way too much like knowledge of certain terms and yeah, technology. Jargon. Yeah. Jargon, yeah. Yeah, it's jargon is the worst. So just write us if you if you also feel not that you need immediate help, but you just think that we can improve how we offer you help. That's also helpful, like very helpful for us. It's probably the best ticket. Yeah. So Thanks a lot, Jan. Thanks so much for listening. My understanding is that we have now break. Yeah. Until yeah, yes, I get the microphone uh, back you. to Dania. Yeah, thank you, Rado and, and Jan. Uh, 